Ken Hawkinson, Provost and Academic Vice President. I hope your summer was enjoyable and productive and you're ready to start a new and exciting academic year here at Western. I will try not to keep you too long this morning as I know that you all have a lot to do in preparation for the new semester. However, this seventh annual faculty assembly provides an opportunity for us to welcome our new faculty and administrators and to share information about what is happening on our campus. In your packets, you will find the academic goals for 2014-15, the FERPA policy, and the timeline for faculty evaluation. This morning, President Jack Thomas will bring a welcome and update us on various issues before us in the coming year. Vice President Brad Bainter will provide an update on marketing and fundraising initiatives. We will then receive an update on enrollment and our new scholarship program from admissions director, Dr. Andy Borst, and then I will give the State of Academic Affairs address. Now let's begin with some introductions. I, I saw that one of our Board of Trustees members is here. Roger Clawson, will you stand and be recognized? Where are you, Roger? Hi, Roger. And I also see that the Mayor of Macomb has joined us today. Mike Emmon, will you please stand up? <laughs> and we have two new deans. Uh, so let me take the opportunity to present Dr. Jack Elfink, who is serving as the Interim Dean of the College of Business and Technology, and Dr. Erskine Smith, who is serving as the Interim Dean of the College of Education and Human Services. The foundation of every great university is its faculty. This morning we would like to introduce our new faculty and leading off this part of our program is Dr. Michael Lorenzen, Dean of the University Libraries. Well, good morning. I'm delighted to see all the new and returning faculty here this morning. I'd encourage everyone to visit the library. We have several, we're going to have several exciting events this year, and we also have a lot of new additions to our collection. There are no new faculty in the library this year. However, I would like to point out Jean Sturman is now our new assistant dean. So Jean, could you please stand? Thanks, Jean. Thank you. At this time, I now invite Dr. Susan Martinelli-Fernandez, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, introduced the new faculty in her college. We'll never learn. It needs to be lower. Thank you, Michael. And welcome colleagues, new and returning. Will our new College of Arts and Sciences colleagues rise and remain standing when I call your name? And please accept my apologies and a free lunch on me if either I fail to recognize you or if I fail to pronounce your names correctly. Andrea Alvashir, Sociology and Anthropology, PhD, University of Minnesota, will you please rise? Alyssa Anderson, Sociology and Anthropology, Masters, Western Illinois University. Jenny Kaplan, Philosophy and Religious Studies, MTS and World Religions from Harvard Divinity School, and ABD, Syracuse. Mei Li Chen, Chemistry, PhD from the University of Southampton, United Kingdom. John Dieterman, Chemistry, PhD from the University of North Texas. Abe Graber, Philosophy and Religious Studies, PhD from the University of Iowa. Kayvon Hassani Monfarad, Mathematics, PhD, University of Wyoming. Andres Ihar, History, Masters, University of Texas, ABD, Northern Illinois University. Sharon Hunter, African American Studies, Masters, Western Illinois University. 
doctorate in ministry, Colgate Divinity School. Christy Keith, psychology, Psy D, University of Indianapolis. Elizabeth Keeble, psychology, masters, Western Illinois University. Theodore Rice, mathematics, Iowa State University. Norma Suvac, women's studies, PhD, Washington University, St. Louis. Tracy Walters, masters, Northern Illinois University, DeKalb. We have an assistant dean in the Quad Cities this year, Jim Rabchuk. And all the wonderful colleagues, staff, administrators, and faculty in the college, would you please rise so I can thank you for all you did last year and all that you'll be doing this year. Up, 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 up. You may be seated. I now invite my colleague, Dr. Jack Elfrink, Interim Dean of the College of Business and Technology, to introduce his new faculty for the college. Thank you. Oh, I need to adjust this upward just slightly. <laughs> <coughs> I'll not make the same deal that uh, the previous dean did. Uh, I have three people to introduce. I would be buying three lunches. So, um, I would ask the previous college. I would ask the, our new faculty to please rise when I uh, read your name and remain standing until everyone is introduced. Our uh, first new faculty member is uh, Vitaly uh, Braskin. Uh, Vitaly, would you please rise? There he is. Uh, if you uh, see him uh, after the meeting, give him an uh, extra attaboy. Uh, two weeks ago, he finished defending his dissertation, so he's not officially a PhD, but as soon as he gets the margins figured out on his paper, <laughs> uh, he will finish his PhD at the University of Arkansas. Uh, Dr. Soon-to-be Dr. Patali will be teaching in the Department of uh, Marketing and Management and Marketing in the Supply Chain Area. Man, uh, area. Uh, the second person I will be introducing is uh, Jonathan Devereaux. Jonathan? Jonathan uh, will be in the Department of Economics and Decision Science. Uh, Jonathan uh, graduated last year out of our Masters of uh, Economics program. Uh, Jonathan has one additional teaching assignment this year. He needs to teach me how to tie that bow tie. <laughs> uh, last but not least uh, is Dr. Uh, uh, Wishan. Uh, Wee San uh, Wan. Uh, Dr. Wan is a, uh, has his PhD from the University of Iowa. So please join me in uh, welcoming our new faculty. I would now like to invite Dr. Erskine Smith, Interim Dean of the College of Education and Human Services, to introduce the new faculty uh, from his college. It seems like adjusting the mic is one of the things we have to do, so let me move it up. <laughs> Those new faculty in the College of Education and Human Services, would you please stand and remain standing uh, when I call your name? And the individuals are Judy Berglund. She will be in the Department of Social Work. Judy has her PhD in Social Work from Michigan State University. Michael Curtis. Michael will be in Law Enforcement and Justice Administration. He has a JD from Duquesne University. Eric Grizel. Eric will be teaching nutrition in the Department of Dietetics, Fashion Merchandising, and Hospitality. And Eric just defended his dissertation a couple of weeks ago, and it will be from Michigan State University. Mr. Daniel Jones. Daniel Jones has a master's in recreation park and tourism administration from Western Illinois University, and he will be teaching in that department this year. Daniel is coming to as a uh, dissertation fellow. Wan Mu Ku. 
will also teach in the Department of Dietetics, Fashion, Merchandising, and Hospitality. Uh, Dr. Ku has a PhD in Retail and Consumer Sciences from the University of Tennessee. Tamara Laprade will be new to the faculty this year. Tamara will be in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Her master's degree is from the University of Virginia. Megan Lyons will be joining us in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. She has an EDD uh, in Educational Leadership from Valdosta State University. Jerry Me Robinette, Recreation Parks and Tourism Administration. His master's is from Sports and Tourism from the University of Illinois. And I believe uh, Mr. Robinette has or is defending his dissertation within the next couple of weeks. And finally, the last individual for our college is Ms. Monica Wright, who will also be in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction. Monica has a master's in reading from Western Illinois University. You may be seated. I now invite Mr. William Claw, Dean of the College of Fine Arts and Communication, to introduce new faculty for the college. Good morning, everybody. So I want to welcome all of you back and then welcome some of our new faculty into the College of Fine Arts and Communication. If you guys would stand and then we'll give you a resounding round of applause at the end. Daniel Chapman, Theater and Dance from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Eileen Garwood, sorry, got to use them. School of Music, Temple University. Nadine Grant, Theater and Dance, University of Missouri, Kansas City. Tammy Honesty, Theater and Dance, West Virginia University. Sean Ingracia, Broadcasting, Western Illinois University. Carrie Monson, Communication Sciences and Disorders, University of Nebraska. Sarah Patton, Communication Sciences and Disorders, University of Wales, Cardiff. Brad Pearson, School of Music, University of Washington. Rahul Rastogi, Communications, Purdue University. And Penny Shoemate, School of Music, Louisiana State University. I'd also like to recognize our new chair in theater and dance, Tammy Killian. And our interim dean, for our interim director, sorry, I don't have an interim dean, uh, in the... <laughs> Uh, Museum Studies program in the Quad Cities is Don McLean. So, welcome everybody. And now I give you our provost. Thank you, deans, for introducing our new faculty. On behalf of the Western Illinois University community, I welcome our newest faculty members. I can assure you that you've made a wise choice in joining Western's faculty, and we were wise in selecting you. In a previous faculty assembly speech, I proposed that space plus values equals place. To simply occupy space would lead to a very unfulfilling career. We need to be vested in a place, a community wherein we value what we do and where we value each other. You have made the right choice to come to Western and Macomb. Around you are nearly 700 faculty and administrative affairs staff and over 60 administrators. These are your colleagues, and I hope you seek guidance from them. Draw from their knowledge and experience and offer your support to them in any way that you can. You are in the right place. Welcome. Now, I see that Rick Carter has brought in a delegation of teachers who are visiting us from China. So let's give them a welcome to our university and to our country. Could you please stand? <laughs> okay. I now want to take the opportunity to introduce the Vice Presidents of Western Illinois University. And please stand as I call your name and hold your applause. Uh, Ms. Julie DeWeese, Vice President for Administrative Services. Dr. Joseph Reeves, Vice President for Quad Cities and Planning. Dr. Gary Biller, Vice President for Student Services and Mr. Brad Bainter, the Vice President for Advancement and Public Services. Please join me in welcoming the Vice Presidents. It is now my 
pleasure to introduce the president of Western Illinois University, Jack Thomas. Dr. Thomas's love for education and the development of excellence among his students has been evident throughout his career. He is a noted scholar and lecturer, appearing as a keynote speaker, presenting his research and inspirational messages locally, nationally, and internationally. Please join me in welcoming the 11th president of Western Illinois University, Dr. Jack Thomas. Good morning. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning. All right. Welcome to another academic year here at Western Illinois University. I want to welcome our newest faculty members and staff and those who are returning. This is an exciting time to be here at Western Illinois University. As you make preparation for this academic year, there will be individual and group achievements. We are excited that we continue to ch change the overall academic profile of our student body. Our incoming freshman class has some of the highest scholastic scores in the recent history of this great university. Currently, our fall to fall retention rate for freshmen has gone from 63% to 71.3%. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Let me say this, we will have the final numbers for you after 10th day reporting. <laughs> we continue to explore new ways to retain students and to improve our retention and graduation rates. Because of our new first year experience program, the Building Connections Mentoring Program, the Western Commitment Scholarship Program, and many other programs, we will have experienced much success in improving our retention rates, which will enhance our overall graduation rates. Therefore, we will do well in meeting state and national expectations regarding student success. As you look around our university, you will see that we have made progress on our capital projects with the renovation of the lobby of Thompson Hall, the renovation of phase one of the university union, the construction of a new parking lot in anticipation for the Center for the Performing Arts, the opening of phase two of the Quad Cities campus in which we will have a ribbon cutting in September and the beautification and landscape on University Drive and across the campus. We are thrilled that Governor Quinn released the $71.8 million for construction of the Center for the Performing Arts. As of today, we are on schedule to break ground during the spring semester of 2015 we have made plans to request a new science complex. This complex will consist of new construction as well as renovations to existing facilities. Currently, the new science complex is number five on the Illinois Board of Higher Education's capital list. Our budget continues to be a challenge and we continue to have cash flow concerns. Currently, the state owes the university $6.5 million for FY14. Now, this is much better as compared to the past years. Western Illinois University has a history of conservative fiscal management and sound financial practices. We've been able to effectively manage through the budgetary shortfalls, and we will continue to do so. Despite these challenges, we cannot afford to stand still during these very difficult budgetary times. We will move this university forward while addressing the challenges that we face. Provost Hawkinson has strongly advocated the reallocation of additional funds to support faculty research and faculty travel, and I have approved the request. Understanding the need to support technology on campus, I have approved the release of funds to increase bandwidth and wireless access. You will find that classroom bandwidth has increased by 50 times. Now that deserves a round of applause also. 
I have allocated significant resources to upgrade technology in many of our electronic classrooms this summer. Significant resources have also been allocated to upgrade the network infrastructure. I am sure that you all have noticed the university's new, attractive, and responsive web page design. Other funds have been released to support essential needs in the colleges. Dr. Hawkinson will be sharing these with you during his presentation. You will be happy to know that we have extended Vice President's approvals of purchases and travel from $500 to $1,000. Come on. <laughs> Based on our contractual obligations, last year we provided the 3.5% salary increases plus additional funds for promotion, minima, and PAA for faculty. I would like to thank Dr. John Miller and the leaders of the University Professionals of Illinois for negotiation with our bargaining team. Please stand for your five seconds of fame, you and your leadership team. I also want to thank Provost Hawkinson, Associate Provost Kathy Newman, and Budget Director Matt Bierman for serving on the administrative side. Will you all please stand to be recognized? We successfully negotiated basic increases of 2% for FY15, 2% in FY16, and 1% in FY17. I also want to thank the other unions that work with us in bargaining similar outcomes. We appreciate the spirit of all unions and employees in helping us manage through these difficult budgetary times. I will discuss more about our plans for the future of Western Illinois University during my Founders Day address on September 23rd here in Macomb and in the Quad Cities on September 24th. As we move forward in this new academic year, it is my pledge to keep the university community informed on new developments affecting our beloved institution. During this academic year, it is necessary that we all communicate well and that we communicate often. This year, I will develop, implement, and maintain a presidential blog. I will host several town hall meetings university-wide, including town hall meetings in each college and the library. I will continue to host the President's Roundtable, which consists of faculty who will discuss the issues at hand and provide me with constructive advice. I will also develop a President's Roundtable for staff members. I will continue to work with the Faculty Senate and other governing bodies, including the Student Government Association. I will continue to meet with our alumni nationally and internationally and work with our development officers to raise funds to support our mission. We will continue to make decisions that we believe serve the greater good of this university. Everybody deserves to be treated with civility and mutual respect. We are all in this together. Let's make this a great year. Thank you and I wish you much success here at Western Illinois University. Thank you, President Thomas. Brad Bainter has worked at WIU almost since its founding. Uh, actually, Brad and I were students at Western uh, here in the mid-1970s, and so I know how long Brad has, has been around. He is a two-time alum of WIU. In 2010, he was named the Vice President for Advancement and Public Services. Brad oversees university relations, university television, and he's in charge of development and fundraising and works with our foundation board. He and the Advancement and Public Services staff have done an excellent job of managing the university's marketing campaign during these very challenging fiscal times. 
Brad also led our successful $60 million campaign, actually raising an amazing $63 million. Please join me in welcoming Brad Bainter. I left my cane at my seat for this uh, presentation. And I make <clears throat> no promises like Dean Sue Martin Ali Fernandez because, as you know, I am old now. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, so I would certainly not try and remember names and ages and all that kind of stuff. So, and in my world of fundraising, there are uh, there are free lunches, but not really. So, <laughs> uh, Ken asked me to just give you a brief update. I'll actually ask for about 60 minutes of material, and for you, I've put it down to about 10 uh, on marketing and fundraising, where we've been, and where we're going. Um, one of the points in the Noel Levitt study from a few years ago was that Western needed to take back the local region as our region. If you walked around campus a few years ago when that report first came out or in the community or attended a sporting event, you were most likely to see more shirts and signs from other colleges and universities uh, than you were for Western. And you definitely did not see purple or gold uh, being worn. You would have a hard time buying purple or gold shirt anywhere in town or even in the bookstore. So we decided to embark on a local campaign, Think Purple, to get our faculty, staff, students, and local community to think about Western and support Western by wearing purple. Our idea was to turn this campus and community purple. This included signage and banners and flags, both on campus and in the community. We received considerable uh, support from Jude Kaya and the bookstore and from the, the foundation to get this started. It was very popular, and last year, the Think Purple shirt was the best-selling t-shirt in the bookstore. To date, over 60 local businesses and companies have bought into this and put their employees in Western clothing, especially on weekends of significance, such as homecoming, move-in weekend, parents' weekend, to name a few occasions. Businesses such as Walmart, The Sports Corner, Walgreens, Buffalo Wild Wings, Domino's, Chubby's, Magnolia's, Larry A's have allowed us to put signage inside and outside their buildings. This program is still ongoing, and if you attend athletic events on campus now, you will notice a sea of purple in the stands. We've received many compliments from alumni and students alike, so we visited with one of our alumni who is the CEO of a marketing firm in Chicago. And after visits with her and taking our budget into consideration, it was decided we should expand this program through a billboard campaign around the state, which we did and still utilize to this day. At the same time, we were being told by prospective students and high school counselors they liked the idea and the simplicity of Think Purple. We asked then Associate Dean of the College of Business and Technology, John Dre, to use a graduate class to survey, uh, survey our alumni, faculty, and staff about their thoughts of the campaign. They emailed the survey to approximately 30,000 people and got a very high response rate to this survey. Uh, there were probably about 50 pages of comments, so people took it seriously. On the fringe, we were either idiots or geniuses for this campaign. And we did receive uh, from the majority some very good comments and suggestions that we took to, to heart. And overall, the campaign was well received, and we released those results last spring. We also developed commercials to be shown on television in our local region and movie theaters throughout Illinois, Iowa, Wisconsin, Missouri, and Indiana during the holiday break and spring break when prospective students are out of school and at the theaters. We have one that is used for a 15-second filler spot, and we have four 30-second spots. Uh, we moved to a new format last year, keeping Think Purple in the background, but focusing on success, success stories. So I just want to take a few moments so you can see those commercials uh, that were last year's efforts. Here they are now. That's me, Chris Lovingood, a senior broadcasting major at Western Illinois University. From networking in D.C. at a national conference to getting hands-on experience behind the news desk and in the field, the opportunities I have at WIU are preparing me for a successful media career. This is my story. What will your success story be? That's me, Joe Decker, owner of San Diego-based Gut Check Fitness, Guinness Book or world record holder, world's fittest man, and WIU graduate. There are a few things that have helped me get to the top of my industry. Growing up on a farm in the Midwest, serving in the US military, and graduating from WIU. This is my story. What will your success story be? My name is Patrick McGoon, and I have the privilege of serving as the President and Chief Executive Officer of Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital in Chicago. I'm also a very proud alumni of Western Illinois University. It gave me the foundation I needed to build a very successful career. 
That's my story. What will your success story be? Hi, that's me, Sammy Marshall, a junior exercise science major at Western Illinois University, shortstop on the Leatherneck softball team, and Summit League Player of the Year. At Western, I take my GPA just as seriously as I take my batting average. My experiences with faculty, my coaching staff, and the community are helping shape my future in exercise science. This is my story. What will your success story be? What did you want to be when you grew up? Now, how do you make it happen? Think purple. Think success. Think Western Illinois University. Um, those were those commercials were targeted to specific areas and regions based on where the student or the alum were from or what the, what the, on TV we might be putting it for. If Sammy, for example, for a Super Bowl a game, we might take an athletic one like that and put it in there. So uh, those were well received. We're working on new and different commercials uh, for this year, uh, somewhat on the same theme. We hope to have those out very soon. I want to thank uh, and recognize our University Television Unit for all their ideas and hard work uh, on these projects. They're here today filming, so please give them a hand for all their efforts. I also want to thank uh, Darcy Schinberger, Teresa Colzenberg, and Teresa Little for their efforts. Marketing does not fall in any of their job descriptions, and this takes up an incredible amount of time above and beyond their real jobs. And together with University Television, we have saved Western literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over the past few years. I know Darcy's here, but please uh, recognize them as well. We are also in the early phases of first-time effort at digital marketing, affirming the Quad Cities as a contract with us for this effort. Banner ads are now appearing on Google, YouTube, Pandora, Hula, Twitter, Yahoo, and Bing, and our efforts are focused in the Chicago area, central and west central Illinois, and southern Illinois and Missouri. Early indications are we're receiving higher than expected levels of interest from, from all these ads uh, appearing in these social media areas. Finally, logo usage has been a big part of our marketing effort. We have hired a firm, LRG, to assist with this effort. Uh, they visit businesses and individuals interested in using our logo and oversee the licensing procedure and also provide legal support when our logos are being used incorrectly or without permission. This has resulted in royalties going from nearly non-existent to pushing $80,000 annually, which we then stick right back into our marketing program. Uh, there's also an ongoing effort to whittle down all kinds of logos uh, that were uh, uh, being used when we first began this effort to one or two very recognizable logos for the university. Uh, on to uh, fundraising. Uh, it was mentioned we completed a campaign. We had uh, just a lot of help from our alumni and from our staff, development people, to, to get that campaign completed. Uh, last fall on Founders Day, we announced a gift of $1.5 million from alumni Ken and Lorraine Epperson. The gift uh, pushed us past our campaign goal of $60 million. We ended the campaign December 31st with just over $63 million in gifts and pledges. Giving averaged just under $5 million per year in our previous campaign. It jumped to over $9 million per year during this campaign. The largest gift, a gift of real estate, resulted in a $5 million plus endowment in support of our foreign languages program. The campaign was significant in its impact on our endowment and on the university. In 1990, we had 62,000 alumni and an endowment of 1 million. 14 years later, in 2004, the endowment had grown to 14 million. Ten years later, at the conclusion of the campaign last December, the endowment nearly tripled to over $40 million. This in spite of a 17% hit it took during the economic depression around 2008 or 2009. At this time, with an alumni base that is now at 125,000, doubled since 1990, the endowment has grown to over $43 million, and the total asset base of the foundation is right at $60 million. Uh, I have one more video I want to show you that we uh, uh, aired at our major donor banquet last year, thanking our donors, uh, and we'll show that right now.
are all connected by our love for Western Illinois University, and we all make a difference in the lives of our students. Think purple, think success, think Western Illinois University. As I mentioned, we showed this video <clears throat> excuse me, at our annual dinner to thank our donors this past spring. We featured many of our students talking about their time at Western at this same dinner and their future plans. It was very gratifying to hear some of them stand up and say that because of scholarship support, they were graduating with little or no debt from Western Illinois University, and many of them were able to point out into the audience to the donors uh, there for their scholarship and say thank you in person. One of the questions all of us that work in development uh, here at Western get when we are asking for support it's not how much do faculty and staff give back to Western. It's not how much, but it's how many. How many give back to the place they work? What percentage of your faculty and staff believe enough in the place they work to give back a little bit? We do get that question, and sometimes what we ask for hinges on do we believe in our own mission. So if I may, I challenge the deans who have all been supportive of us to have a discussion with their chairs about support for Western. I challenge the chairs to have a discussion with their faculty about support for Western. It's easy enough to do this through payroll deduction. If you have a department of 10 people and you all do $25 a month for 10 months, you have $2,500 in support that can be used for scholarships or travel or research or whatever your department deems important and need of support. If we can get that percentage over 50% or 60%, it makes our jobs, our lives much easier in trying to raise additional funds for the university. And I, there are so many here that do so much for us right now, and I thank you for your support. And if you're not, I, I just ask you to consider it. And a challenge does not come without a challenge. I'm challenging myself to visit this thing called collegiality this year. There are too many outstanding opportunities on this campus to hear lectures, see performances, watch students in action, to pass by. I've tried to get to too many of the act activities in past years, and I'm going to redouble my efforts this year. I hope to see you there at your department events, your college events, university and even community-wide events. I hope you take the time to get to know your students and what they're involved in at Western. We have outstanding students here, and we have outstanding faculty and staff. One of the greatest pleasures I have as I travel and meet with alumni is to come back to campus and send a note or make a call to a faculty member because one of our alumni has asked if Dr. Smith or Dr. Jones is still there, and please tell them they make a difference in my life. I can only imagine what the faculty member must feel like to hear that. It's much easier and rewarding to work together than to work against each other to make Western Illinois University the best it can be. Let's work together to make this a great year at Western. I thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit about advancement in public services with you. Have a great year. Thanks, Brad. Andy Borst joined WIU in 2008. In 2012, he became the director of the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. With the help of the admission staff, Andy has taken innovative, dynamic, and proactive approaches to enrollment management. Today, he will update us on the university's efforts in this area. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Andy Borst. Good morning. I will attempt to be brief. I know you have a busy day today. We have the PowerPoint come up. There we go. Uh, Ken asked me to, to come up and give an enrollment update and to be as transparent as possible as we have done the last three years. And I'll share the good, the bad, and the ugly about what our enrollment is looking like for this fall. I'll first talk about total enrollment, then give you a snapshot of what our freshman class looks like. Excuse me. Talk about our best talking point, retention, then talk about our new freshman class, then highlight our new scholarship program, which is in the view books that were handed out as you came in today, and then share a little bit more about uh, what we've heard from our focus groups from new freshmen last fall. Total enrollment numbers. As President Thomas said, it's not done until 10th day. So we'll give you a range and a general idea of where we're looking at. We have four enrollment buckets. Macomb on campus, Macomb off campus, Quad Cities on campus, and Quad Cities off campus. Our Macomb numbers are coming in about where we expected them to. We're down about 200 students, which is what we expected with larger graduating classes leaving us in our drop in retention in the last two years. Uh, Macomb off campus is actually a little bit higher than we expected. Quad City numbers, we were expecting a little bit more with our, our new phase two opening this fall. It 
there's still several days to open up after we've got everybody moved in. I know the academic advisors up there have lots of appointments and getting people in the last minute. We'll register probably about 300 to 400 more students between now and 10th day, so it'll be a busy time. Where our growth market has been is largely Quad Cities off campus, so students in the Quad Cities area who are taking one or two classes, but their majority of the hours may be online. In October, three different offices did projections of where we expected to end up uh, in the fall and 10th day of fall, this fall semester. So institutional research and planning, the budget office, and then my office each did separate projections independent of each other and got a surprisingly similar result. We were expecting about 11,400. Last year, we were at 11,700. So we were expecting a drop of about 200 to 300 students coming for this fall. We will be about in that ballpark. We may even be a little bit higher than that. I would say that if you had to peg me in a number today, it would be about 11,500, and that is due largely to the, uh, the good work that Rick Carter has been doing within international students and the numbers that we see coming in from that area. In, a, in addition to the increase in freshman retention, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but um, we're seeing an increase in the number of international students that we're bringing in, as well as we expected a pretty significant decrease in new transfer students. We thought that it would decrease by about 10% this year, and the transfer numbers are holding their own. For our new freshman class, we expect to be down anywhere from 40 to 50 students. For our new transfers and new graduate numbers, those are about even, and as President Thomas said, our freshman retention rate has gone from 63%, and as of right now, we are at 71.3%. We could creep up to 71.5% with students coming in at the last minute. Our fall-to-fall -fall retention rate is the best news that I can share. We have gone, as I said, from the 63% to 71%, and that is important for three different reasons. Number one, it's more students in the pipeline continuing on to their sophomore year, so it's freshman to sophomore retention. The second point is it's a great marketing piece. We won a national award for our retention efforts. We were the only state university to win the award and only three institutions in the entire nation won the award. And the third biggest reason is the subsequent impact on our six-year graduation rate. Both freshman retention rate and the six-year graduation rate are key indices for what the General Society uh, looks at for institutional quality. And I want to prepare you because of the 67 and 63% retention rate that we had in the last two years will translate into 2018 and 2019, our, our six-year graduation rate actually falling below 50%. And then in 2020, we will see a, an immediate jump back up above that 50% mark. So we just need to be prepared to defend when we hit that point that our retention rate will go back up and our graduation rate will go back up. One of the critiques of the graduation rate, and I, I have said this privately, is that a big reason why our retention rate went back up is that we have an increase in our fre the quality of our freshman class. And that is only a partial truth. And in fact, it's, it's less true than I expected. I, we brought in 50 students at the top end, the Centennial group of students who have at least a 32 ACT and a 3.5 GPA. And then we cut out 100 students from a, the bottom end of our academic scale from our OAS class. And so we would expect with an increased quality, that would impact our retention rate. However, when we only look at our regular admits, they weren't all that different academically or economically, and the freshman retention rate for that group went up almost 7%. That means that it's more than the selection of inputs equating to outputs. Something that we are doing with students is having a significant difference in them staying and continuing on with their education. And I'd like to be able to stand up here and say that it's about our Building Connections program or the changes to the FYE program in University 100 or the ORS reporting system or the new uh, programming that we're doing in the residence halls. But in actuality, it's probably a cumulative effect of all of those things working together and the renewed emphasis on campus of all of us being aware of student success leading to retention. Maybe we'll go forward. Here we go. What that means for our total enrollment. So when I stood up here last year and said that we had a freshman class of about 120 fewer new freshmen coming in, when we carry that forward into their sophomore year, because of the increase in retention, that means that there's about 48 more students in the pipeline because of that increase. Looking at our new freshman class for this fall, it has been a hard-fought recruitment cycle. Um, if you saw me in May, we were down probably 260 new freshmen, and so we have come a long way from that point. Moving into the next recruitment cycle, 2015 is the low point for high school graduates in the state of Illinois. 
It will go back up a little bit in the next year, but it will pretty much plateau at that point. But this next year will be the hardest um, group of new freshmen to go out and get because there's fewer of them. Of the group that's there graduating from the state of Illinois, 20% of them will go out of state. We've heard a rumor that 40% of the University of Missouri's incoming class will be from the state of Illinois. We've heard the University of Iowa and Iowa State also have large classes. So our, and it's not just uh, a certain amount of our students are going out, it's our best students that are leaving the state. Of the students who are there, the bottom 50% aren't college ready and may not attend any college. So that leaves us to fight for about 44,000 students and with increased competition, especially in the Chicagoland area, everyone knows within the nation that Illinois is exporting students like crazy and they have increased the number of regional admissions counselors in the Chicagoland area by 100 in the last four years. So we are facing greater competition for fewer students. When we look at our freshman class, we break them up into three groups. The OAS class is the students who don't meet our admission standards but show promise that they might be able to succeed with some additional advising and interventions. Our regular ad admission students are our middle 50% students, so within the academic scale, it's about an 18 to 23 ACT, which is the middle 50% within the nation. And then our WCS would be our Western Commitment Scholarship students, which is about 25% of our class, our academically talented group, with a 22 ACT and a 3.0 GPA. And for the most part, our regular admits in our OAS class are unchanged. Where we're seeing a big decrease is in our Western Commitment Scholarship students, and specifically in the 22 to 29 ACT range. So while the size of our group is less by about 40 students, that is almost entirely among our scholarship students. Where our students are coming from, largely from Chicagoland area, mostly from suburbs as well as the city of Chicago, that's 60%. Uh, where we saw declines in this last cycle is uh, in the north and central Illinois area as well as our local area. And so as uh, Vice President Boehner said, we have to get back and own our, our local neighborhood so that we're attracting more of our students. And we've actually put out a press release in the last couple of weeks saying that we will waive the application fee for our local students in the McDonough County, nine county area, and we will do a similar offer to our students that are in the Quad Cities area. By county breakdown of where we're down and where we're up, we did well within Cook County, which is Chicago land. Kane County is a west suburb of Chicago. Champaign, Illinois is kind of an anomaly on here. We haven't traditionally pulled students from Urbana-Champaign area. St. Clair County is the St. Louis area. And then where we're down is Will County, which is a south suburb, Winnebago County, which is the uh, northern uh, Illinois County around Rockford, McDonough County, obviously in Macomb, and then Scott County, Iowa. So that's where we're seeing our increases and decreases by county. We are much more diverse than we have been. Within this freshman class, we are down significantly within our white students. We are up within our African American and our Hispanic students. That follows the trend of what we're seeing at high school enrollments. And so our total minority enrollment has gone from about 26% to just under 30% for this year. However, although they're different academic, excuse me, they're, uh, they're different demographically, they are not all that different economically. So when we look at the breakdown by income level, where we saw about 60 fewer students coming from below the poverty line of that zero to 30,000 family income, and we saw 40 more students coming in from 110,000 and up family income. So we're seeing a much better picture economically that they'll be able to afford the education that we're offering them. About 40% of our students that are coming in have need a parent who have graduated from a four-year university. So again, we have to make sure that we're, we're using vocabulary that we don't assume that students know that they're bringing with them from their families. And last year, we rolled out our new admission standards. And so this was the first cycle where we've gone out with our new standards. So I wanted to show you kind of the impact of, of the new standard. We weren't necessarily trying to change the type of student that we were attracting, but we were becoming known as an OAS or conditional admission institution. And so we wanted to make sure that we have spaces for students who don't quite meet that standard, but we didn't want to become primarily for students who don't meet that standard. So we've gone from the grid, which is the colored top chart, and that no longer exists within our recruitment standard. We now have a line formula, so if a student is above uh, ACT plus 10 times their GPA is greater than or equal to 46, then they know that that student is an automatic regular admission student. The impact of that, so as we saw our number of OAS applications increasing dramatically, saying to high school counselors, this is the type of student that we want, send us this type of student, we saw for the first time a, a big decrease in the number of OAS applications, and we were more selective within our OAS class to pick out students that are likely to succeed. Oops, sorry. 
our regular admission students that are not scholarship. This is what we wanted to see. We had a 500 student increase in the number of our regular admission students. So we were saying, here's the line of a student that will, has an 80% chance of succeeding at Western, send us these students, and we got more students to apply. Within the Western Commitment Scholarship groupings, the shaded area on the right is when we started the program. We started uh, the Commitment Scholarship program about midway through the 2012 cycle, so we didn't see a big spike within applications. But after we had a full year of, of talking about the Commitment program, we saw a lot more students apply. And for this year, we had a little bit of decrease in those number of students who are applying, but that's not as concerning as the number of students who enrolled from that grouping. So we saw a lot fewer of those students who we would offer a scholarship to actually enroll. We do pretty well with that 32 and above, so students that are scoring in the top 1% of the nation on their ACT or SAT, we've gone from having about 8 to 10 of those students to 45 to 50 of those students enrolling. And those are the students that we're going to be putting out in front of our marketing effort. We have done really well with attracting those students. Where we are seeing the decrease is with the 22 to 29 ACT. And what we found out, we haven't increased our scholarship grid since 2012, but we have increased our total cost during that time. So we've increased our total cost of tuition, fees, room, and board by about $1,500, but our lowest scholarship level was $1,000. So we've negated the impact of our lowest scholarship level for our students with a 22 to 24 ACT. We also found out that other state universities followed our lead. And they created their own scholarship grids. They don't market the grid the same way that we do, but they have put more money into their programs and come over the top of us. I wish that I, it was a different reality, but we are in a scholarship arms race for top students. Private schools have been doing this forever. Public schools are just now getting in the game when it comes to, to discounting. But when we overlay our scholarship grid on top of Northern Illinois' scholarship grid, the black square at the top is the only grouping of students that we are having a better scholarship offer which is not surprising because that is the students that we're being successful in attracting. The, the scholarship offer that's going out to students is as much about the rational choice model of who's given me the best offer as it is the emotional impact of Western or Northern Illinois must want me more even though Western will be cheaper for me to go to. Northern wants me more because they're giving me more scholarship. We do the same comparison with Eastern Illinois, and we've heard that Eastern is also going to increase their scholarship grid in the next year. The black square is the only area where we have a competitive advantage. Carbondale has increased their freshman class significantly last year, and we've also heard that they might increase it this year, and this is a big reason why. Heavy discounting for their top students. Edwardsville's program, same sort of thing. We actually offer um, scholarships to the 22 to 24 area of uh, the students who are comparing us and, universe, and Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. However, because our cost is greater, there's uh, not as big of competitive advantage for that grouping. Illinois State has a different model. Uh, they spend about $11 million in state institution money back to discounting for students. However, they don't have a scholarship grid. They make sure the students that they want can afford to be there. And while this data is a little bit dated, this is uh, from 2011, they spend $11 million back to their students, and $10 million of that $11 million is spent in need-based aid. And when we look at the, the um, income differences, while we were going around the state saying we are the affordable institution, a student could go to Illinois State with the academic profile that we wanted to for $3,000 less than they were giving from us. So to highlight our new scholarship program, when you came in, you got a view book. This is our new recruiting materials for our, our new freshmen. If you could take a look at page 18 of that. I'd like to introduce our, our updated Western Commitment Scholarship Program. And this will begin fall 2015. And I'll start at the top end with the explanation. Uh, these will be our centennial students before they needed a 32 ACT and a 3.5 GPA, we are lowering that to a 30 ACT and a 3.0 GPA. We're expecting about 60 students with this in, within this range. We no longer offer a room waiver, but they're still getting the same uh, tuition dollar discount of $10,000, and that's purely a merit aid. So when they're accepted to the university, they get their accept letter on a Monday, and they're getting their scholarship offer on a Tuesday. 
So because we want to create an early incentive to get that student. On October 12th of this year, we're going to invite every single student that we buy from ACT, meaning that they have not, not yet applied, a chance to come to campus and interview for one of our four to five presidential scholarships, which is truly a, a full ride. And what we're really trying to do with that effort is to just get them on campus and show those students that we really want them here. When we look at the lower scholarship amounts, there's a range. And when a student is initially admitted to the university, they will get that first dollar amount of the 2,000, 2,500, 3,000, which is an increase of over our old scholarship model. And then there's an increase up to a maximum amount that bridges the gap between the amount of grant aid that the student is getting and loan aid that the student is getting. And why those dollar amounts are important. I should also highlight, excuse me, I should also highlight that we were, are also going to start offering scholarships to students with at least a 20 ACT, whereas below the threshold was a 22. Why those dollar amounts are important. What looks like a great merit program is actually both a merit program and a need program. So we were taking both the, the program that we had before and replicating a similar model to what Illinois State is doing. So on the, the far left column of a $40,000 family income, they're getting full Pell, which is a federal grant, full MAP, which is a state grant. We are still expecting them to take out the, the max amount of student loans. And since our tuition fees, room, and board are just under 21000 that leaves that student with about a $4,500 gap. So we will give that student the merit and need aid in order to afford to come to Western. We are going to make sure the students that we want and who, have, who are successful at Western can afford to be here. On the opposite end of the spectrum is 110,000 family income. They're not getting Pell, they're not getting MAP, but they have enough money according to the federal formula in order to afford to be here with some additional loans from, this, um, from the federal government. And so they would, that student would get our merit aid. And that's a lot of the students that are within our scholarship grid. Where we needed to have the biggest impact is the middle income student, because they're not getting Pell, they're not getting MAP, and according to the federal formula, they couldn't afford to be here. Those are the students that is typically a bread and butter Western student. And so they will offer, we will offer both the merit and the need amount so that they can afford to come. This is a big, this is a, a bold commitment on our part to say we're going to go get the students that we know can succeed here. A lot of what I do is stand up and, and talk about a lot of the data that we have in front of us. But part of doing a systematic qualitative, a systematic inquiry into our students is also asking them, why they came to Western and what factors were important in their decision to come. And so in the last fall semester, we interviewed about half of the freshman class and talked to them about what factors were important in their decision to come to Western. I'm having clicker problems today. So we talked about 600 students in the residence halls and we got more information than uh, we asked for even. They, they talked to us at length about their experience in selecting Western and also within their transition in the first couple weeks. They feel very supported by faculty. And one of the things we heard time and time again is faculty care as long as you do. So if they're in, you're in. They have an easy transition to campus. What they really struggle with is that they don't know what to do with free time. So when their class ends at 10 o'clock and their next class starts at 2 o'clock, they really just don't have a good idea to use that time, or they do use that time in unproductive ways. Shocking, I know. What was very helpful for us to hear was the ways in which students want to communicate and the ways students don't want to communicate. If you haven't seen one of uh, these, it's these, this is one of our university letterhead and for recruiting students, we send out about 90,000 of these annually. And if a student is interested in us, they will open this piece of mail and read it. But if they're on the fence or if they're no longer interested in us, it just goes in the pile, even unopened. So that letter could say, congratulations, we'd like to offer you a full ride scholarship and it never got opened. We also hear that students don't check their WIUE email before they get here. In fact, they see it as a, an indication that they have committed to come. And so while a lot of us have been sending information to students' WIUE email, again, it, it went unseen. And the last thing that we heard is that although the cell phone is ever present among our students, they don't like to talk on the phone. So if we call them, they will let it ring and go to voicemail, listen to the voicemail, and then maybe call you back. But other than that, they're not picking up the phone. So if they tell us how they're not communicating, they also told us how they want to be communicated with. Postcards were effective, not necessarily for the students to see, but because a postcard doesn't come in an envelope, a parent will pick up a, an oversized postcard and say to a student, you need to look at this. 
handwritten note cards that were personalized and handwritten on the address. Students appreciated that personal touch that we were offering to students. And we heard time and time again, send me a text. Students will respond to text messages very quickly. And Roger Runquist has developed a system where a staff or faculty member can send a text message to a student that appears from our side as an email, but it will appear to a student as a text message. And as long as we're not sending them an iTunes contract in a text message, they will read that. So some of our new strategies within admissions is that uh, the president has merged the Macomb and Quad Cities recruitment staffs. And so we are recruiting not for Macomb, not for the Quad Cities, but we are recruiting for all of the university. We have also opened up a new office in the Metro St. Louis area. St. Louis is a, a population of four million people. That's a quick three hour drive from us. And so we are going to be more active in recruiting that area. And then we have specialized our recruitment staff before our admissions counselors would cover either freshmen and transfers. And now they're doing one or the other. What these allow us to do is increase our visit count to high schools by about 500. So in this next recruitment cycle, we will be in 500 more high schools than where we were at last year. Okay, I promised to be brief and I think I lied. Uh, so the takeaway points are we are facing our lowest number of high school graduates and so it's going to be a hard recruitment cycle for us. Our retention message is the best message that we can send out to say that if a student comes to Western, we will take care of them. We will help them graduate. We are committed to competing for our top students, primarily from our Western Commitment Scholarship students, but as well as I talk to my colleagues in other state universities, and it is like pulling teeth to get faculty to want to be involved in recruitment. And I will tell you that from my experience in the last three years, that has been the opposite for me. I have one of our biggest competitive advantages is a lot of your willingness to actively be involved in recruitment. And then we need to adapt our communication to ways that students want to be communicated with rather than just what methods we're used to using. So. I will be coming to Faculty Senate as well as uh, Faculty Council up in the Quad Cities to talk more about enrollment. Um, I hope, again, welcome, uh, welcome back. We're very happy to have you back. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. As in past years, let me note that in his book, First Century, A Pictorial History of Western Illinois University, Professor Emeritus Dr. John Hallwiss notes that the first faculty meeting at Western Illinois Normal School was held on April 22nd, 1902. During that meeting, faculty and administration convened to discuss the daily schedule, curriculum, and the needs of each department. Today, 112 years later, the faculty and administration of Western Illinois University convene to discuss issues and topics important to our institution. Before I begin my presentation, and my presentation will be about a half hour, I'd like to thank and recognize a few individuals seated in the audience. We have had exceptionally talented student leadership at this institution. And I would like to introduce the student leadership for next year. Mr. Michael Quidley, student member of the Board of Trustees and Mr. David Dunn, President of our Student Government Association. Please stand and be recognized. <laughs> our faculty senate and graduate council were very busy last year. These bodies approved 40 new undergraduate courses, 10 new 400G courses, 22 new graduate courses, six new general education courses, 30 undergraduate program changes, eight graduate program changes, and two new graduate programs. I want to thank the outgoing chair of the Faculty Senate, Dr. Stephen Rock, and all the senators for their important work this past year. I look forward to working with incoming Faculty Senate Chair, Dr. Mandeep Singh, Dr. Rock, Dr. Singh, and all the faculty senators present, both from this past year and this coming year. Will you all please stand and be recognized? Thank you. And I want to thank the outgoing graduate council chair, Dr. Amy Mossman, for her leadership. And I look forward to working with the incoming chair, Dr. Catherine Pawelko, and the graduate council members this year. Dr. Mossman, Dr. Pawako, and all graduate council members, will you please stand and be recognized?
And I want to take this opportunity to th thank Dr. John Miller, the president of UPI, his leadership team, and the faculty and staff for agreeing to spread out the pay increase and extend the contract. For decades, while labor strife has been rampant at other universities in the state, the WIU administration and the WIU UPI chapter have engaged in principled and positive negotiations wherein the welfare of the university, all its employees, students, and all other stakeholders have been given consideration in our discussions. Thanks to the union for its leadership and to all of you for your sacrifice. Would Dr. John Miller, UPI president, and the members of the UPI executive committee please stand and be recognized. Now, as I move on to my address on the state of academic affairs, let me begin with a short story. I recently read a wonderful book by Larry Nielsen, the former provost of North Carolina State University. He wrote on his life as a provost and academic vice president. He points out that few know what a provost is or what a provost does. And so one of his first acts as provost was to address the new student convocation at his school and explain who he was and what he did. At the following table fair, he handed out pencils to all the new students with his title and his office address. Later that day, he was walking across campus with his president, explaining to him how he enlightened all the new students as to what a provost was. To illustrate his point, he stopped a new freshman and said, this morning at the convocation, after being introduced, I explained what a provost does. Do you know what a provost does? The student replied very confidently, of course I know what a provost does. He's the guy who gives away free pencils. <laughs> well, as you are all aware, I am evaluated by the faculty each year. And I thank the many of you who have provided positive comments and or constructive criticism. And what I've heard from three years of evaluations is that it may be unclear for some of you in understanding fully what I do or what the role is of the support areas in the areas that report to my office. So this year, with the help of PowerPoint, I'm going to explain in a little greater detail the many functions of my office and its supporting units. I'll go over how well we've accomplished our goals this past year, and then we'll spend just a few minutes talking about a few of the major issues that we coming up this year and some of the best practices that we employ in academic affairs. And I'm going to switch. Okay, you're all familiar. You're all familiar with the role of our colleges and library, and so I want to concentrate on other support unit areas within academic affairs. And let me begin with the Centennial Honors College. This provides opportunities for our talented and motivated students. It provides them an enriched curriculum in general education and within the major. There are many opportunities for leadership, professional growth, service learning. The Honors College will nominate top students for prestigious awards such as the Rhodes, Truman, Udall, and many others. Twelve students were nominated last year. It hosts the mock presidential election, undergraduate research day, pre-law symposium, and other special events. The Center for Innovation and Teaching and Research provides over 200 programs a year for faculty, staff, and administrators in teaching, research, and technology areas as well as meeting with individual faculty as needed. It provides online teaching support, facilitates the development of the attendance tracker, the student illness reporting uh, software, the ORS program, and other such programs. It administers the Provost Travel Awards and the Provost Awards of Excellence. Institute for Rural Affairs. It provides various programs that are designed to improve the quality of life for our rural citizens. $2.4 million in grants are earned each year by this unit. 
It provides support to communities and transportation needs, management and planning, small business development, and many other areas. Last year, they presented 45 programs around the state, and its very talented faculty published 35 papers. The registrar maintains academic records, determines residency status of students, verifies degree completion, reviews applications for undergraduate readmissions, maintains many, many, many more records, administers the scheduling of over 7,000 classes a year, works with CAGIS and admissions, coordinates commencement on both campuses, and enforces FERPA regulations. Office of Sponsored Projects provides support for the successful administration of, of grants, facilitates full compliance, working with the IRB, with external sponsoring agency guidelines, and provides funding and oversight for the research, University Research Council grants. School of Graduate Studies manages the graduate admission process and academic appeals for graduate students while working with the graduate council. There are 38 graduate programs and over 1,600 graduate students, and we're actually up in the number of graduate students this year as of today. It hosts the Graduate Research Day and other special events. School of Distance Learning, International Studies and Outreach administers the Board of Governors program, degree program, uh, the Bachelor of General Studies degree program with uh, over 1,400 students participating. They facilitate the development, scheduling, and selection of online courses. They administer international recruiting and admissions. They administer the study abroad program and various outreach programs. University Advising. They assist undeclared OAS, transitional advising program students. There are over a thousand students they work with to discover, set, and achieve their academic goals. In addition to assisting with course selection, advisors help students explore major and career options and facilitate their transition to college. They assist students with tutoring services on campus. University Technology. Consolidation has brought together UTech, Ames, Administrative Computing, ESS, Student Service Computing, and Quad Cities Technology Areas into one unit consisting of now 121 employees. UTech supports the mission and vision of Western Illinois University through the application and integration of technology across the campuses. This includes to maintaining the mainframe, wireless and desktop services and devices, all network infrastructure, telecommunications, IT security, maintaining Zimbra, classroom lab support, and the university web pages. All administrative records, business support, financial programming is created and maintained by members of this unit. They provide user support with the help desk, and the Center for Application of Information and Technology serves external clients, such as state agencies, educational institutions, businesses, and public agencies. We also monitor a number of other areas in the provost's office to include accreditation. We have 30 accredited programs and we're growing. Every program that can be accredited should be accredited. And accreditation is a magnet for resources. So it's in your interest to try to have an accredited program. In addition, my office works with Vice President Joe Reeves to prepare for higher learning commission accreditation and to comply with all their rules and regulations. You're all familiar with the assessment program. We have a $78 million personnel budget and a $5 million operating budget. We work with facilities management on the maintenance and programming of all academic buildings on campus. We attend IBHE meetings about every month and work with our institutional research office to comply with all policies and reporting protocols. In the last three years, 47 of our programs have undergone the eight-year program review process. 21 programs will be reviewed in this coming year. Our Office of Diversity. This year will host one dissertation fellow and one visiting professor. We also sponsor six undergraduate graduate students who have been placed throughout the university. We provide for the Expanding Cultural Diversity Project and host the Dealing with Differences Conference. We also help to facilitate the University Diversity Council and other diversity initiatives. Office of Academic Personnel. 
This office helps me in monitoring the academic affairs budget. They, last year, they processed 2,200 employment contracts, 500 requests to fill documents. They maintain personnel files, FMLA requests, clearance forms, time cards, supplemental payments, countless other HR functions are performed by these hardworking professionals. Bargaining unit contract administration. They work with the union to deal with any grievances or legal issues that come before us. We process I-9s and immigration and visa paperwork. We coordinate the retention, tenure, promotion process and the PAA process. We reviewed over 200 evaluation portfolios last year, over 200 PAA documents, and hundreds of other annual evaluation materials and paperwork. And I would like to thank again all those faculty who diligently work in the evaluation process by serving on department personnel committees, college committees, university committees. And I thank you all uh, for your diligence and your hard work. It's the most difficult job on campus, and you all do it well. And first year experience, and you're well aware of all the changes we made to first year experience, and uh, the over 100 university, 100 courses that are taught, the Y courses and other special programs. Altogether, as of May 1st, we had 1,165 employees in academic affairs, 622 faculty, and you see the further breakdowns. These are the directors of the areas that I just briefed you on. I would like the following directors and other academic affairs professionals to stand and be recognized for their tireless work. Well, all of you stand whose names were just posted. All the directors and all the academic affairs personnel. <clears throat> Thank you. You're aware of the five goals that we had set this year. Uh, our goal of enhancing our culture for teaching and learning, fiscal responsibility, enhancing the role of academic affairs and enrollment management, international recruiting, and facilities enhancement and technology support. Let me just go, few, let me just go through a few of these subpoints briefly and, and update you on what we've been doing. Now, a measurement of assessing high standards, maintaining rigor and high standards, is the research and creative output of our faculty. Our faculty last year published 19 books and 372 chapters, monographs, and articles. They participated in 1,115 creative activities, presented 1,026 conference presentations. Overall, the academic profile of our students has gone up in recent years. We've been active partners in the development and support of our Centennial and Commitment Scholarship programs to bring in the best possible students to Western. Many of our highest achieving programs were designated last year as signature programs. One of our sub goals was to support Quad Cities. And this year we have established an academic administrative structure to coincide with the opening of Phase 2 in Quad Cities. Assistant deans have been hired who also continue to teach, and reporting lines of advisors and other academic personnel have been sh uh, shifted to these assistant deans. Courses in the Quad Cities will soon be aligned to the Macomb schedule, continuing to allow for irregularly scheduled classes as demand dictates. We established a director of Quad Cities technology position. We've continued to hire faculty into essential, essential positions in the Quad Cities. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our Quad Cities faculty and staff who made the trip down this morning. Will you all please stand and be recognized? Thank you. One of our sub goals was to continue to expand the scope of the Centennial Honors College. In recent years, our numbers in the Honors College have gone up 35%. There are now over 700 participants in the Honors College. Minority participation has significantly increased. And last year, as you've heard, we recruited nearly 50 Centennial Honors Scholars into the college. We increased course-based civic learning, internships, and service learning opportunities. Many of these opportunities exist across campus. 
We did a special review of our internship programs last year, and a centralized site is being put in place in career services to help co coordinate many of those programs. Supporting undergraduate and graduate research opportunities. As you all know, we have an extraordinarily successful undergraduate research day, 214 total student participants this year. And we also instituted a graduate research conference with 65 participants. We continue funding for faculty and student travel to present their joint research. We support special programs for women in the sciences and government. We're hosting WIU internships in Washington, D.C. in conjunction with the Department of Political Science and the Ready to Run program, which prepares women to run for political office. We're continuing to establish an affiliation with the National Science Foundation's WISE program, which stands for Women in Science and Engineering. We continue to support scholarly and professional activity. 180 faculty received the Provost Travel Award last year, totaling nearly $59,000. We continued with the University Research Council Awards, the International Study Abroad Fellowships for faculty, and we recognize scholarly professional activity through our retention, promotion, tenure, and PAA systems, as well as our Provost Awards of Excellence and our Distinguished Faculty Lecturer. Let's move on to our second goal, and that is fiscal responsibility and accountability. Now, last year, academic affairs had a $3.8 million reduction to the budget, which was followed by a $1.8 million reduction this year. Academic affairs initiated zero-based budgeting to deal with these reductions by establishing budgets based on some of the following, an analysis of equipment needs, the strength of the programs, the number of faculty, previous year's expenses, and many other criteria. I know this reduction in operating budgets was difficult, but we got through the year without any unit going into deficit. We also initiated, in order to save money, we also initiated a number of departmental mergers. Four departments were merged into two. Educational leadership was merged with interdisciplinary education and interdisciplinary studies. Social work was merged with health sciences. In addition, interdisciplinary studies was transferred from the Honors College to distance learning. The study abroad and outreach offices were merged, resulting in the overall elimination of a high-level position. All these mergers have saved high-level positions. And counseling and curriculum and instruction are considering a merger uh, over this next year. I understand that change is difficult. I thank all of those involved for your positive attitude during this transition. We have to continue to identify alternative funding sources. Uh, many of you write grants. 122 external grants were funded last year, totaling $9.8 million. Quad Cities Manufacturing Lab partnered with the University of Illinois on a major federal grant of which we are a part as a matter of fact, our dean for business and technology was in the White House when President Obama announced that our consortium received this grant. The ICR money that is received from these grants is put to good use. Last year, I was able to reallocate uh, $300,000 of ICR money for technology projects, uh, upgrading broadcasting equipment, buying a new truck for the Kibbe Center, and various other initiatives. Working with Vice President Bainter, we have asked each college to develop new fundraising initiatives and review the role of college development officers and to establish budgets, protocols, and new initiatives in the fundraising area. Now, part of our success in managing our budget is directly related to our reliance on the consolidated budget process, wherein departments and colleges work throughout the year to determine needs, prioritize those needs, and then Re submit requests for funding. This process allows my office to direct resources to the areas that are most essential in completing the mission of our departments and programs. The deans and directors present their reports each March, and I present my priorities each April to the president in a public meeting. I won't go through all these individual re requests with you. They are all on my website, but I want you to know that the process works. I direct resources to the areas identified by this process, a process that you all are involved in. 
here are some examples of projects that were considered high priority and essential and that we were able to fund this past year. Our Wessel student numbers have quadrupled in recent years and they needed more space. So we have renovated parts of Simpkins Hall to accommodate their needs. We have finally given <laughs> uh, new living accommodations uh, for our director at Horn Lodge. We're building a new greenhouse for research and teaching purposes out on the farms. And then you can see some of the other areas that we have directed our money to. <clears throat> As you all know, uh, one of our chief goals this year was for academic affairs to play a larger role in enrollment management and student success. Uh, we visited every department to discuss the importance of our role, completed campus-wide recruiting plans. We provided uh, funding uh, to departments for recruiting and for new flat sheets. We're continuing to establish new 2 plus 2 programs with community colleges. We'll continue to expand distance learning opportunities. Last spring, we offered 153 courses online. This summer, 120. This fall, there'll be 147 courses offered online. We are continuing to offer specialized courses for non-degree seeking students as well. Uh, we're participating in the Building Connections and Mentoring Program. Over 200 volunteers university-wide volunteered for this program, and many faculty and academic personnel were among those 200. You all know that what we have done with the first year experience program. Last year, we did a review of our entire advising operation. We're developing a plan of action to address the recommendations found in the self-study and in our external reviewers report. And of course, we always are committed to enhancing access, equity, and multicultural initiatives for the entire campus community, and I went through a number of those items earlier in my presentation. Our fourth, fourth goal is to focus on international recruiting. Our international recruiting continues to be successful and to, uh, we're now over 400 students uh, in our international student body and uh, over 120 students in our Wessel program alone. A number of programs are having exceptional success in recruiting international students. Computer science and physics are examples. We'll continue to increase the number of study abroad opportunities and students participating. We'll continue to cultivate relationships with institutions in foreign countries. International recruiting has increased with visits to China, Indonesia, Iraq, Malaysia, Myanmar, Singapore, South Korea, Thailand, Vietnam, and we visited numerous embassies. We've also hosted delegations from many countries from around the world. And our fifth goal, of course, we are delighted that the money has been released for our long-awaited Center for the Performing Arts, and I believe that we are to break ground sometime in the spring semester. <laughs> Along with upgrading electronic classrooms, we created a collaborative learning space in Curran's Hall. You should all stop by and see it. This is where the uh, former physical science library used to be. Well, it's still there. Okay. <laughs> so, it's still there. <laughs> we are finishing our plans for phase three in the Quad Cities, and a tentative design for our new science center is complete. And you've heard what we've done with the greenhouse and the, uh, the, the new living quarters. <coughs> and approval process is complete uh, for our new strategic plan and technology. The implementation, implementation of the plan is ongoing. We'll continue to replace computers as needed and as funds are available. Our goals for this coming year uh, will be essentially the goals of this past year. Much of this year was spent in planning. In this coming year, we will implement those goals. Now, let me just point out a few things as we look to the future. As you heard uh, from President Thomas, 
uh, he has uh, approved the release of funds for faculty travel, first with regard to the Provost Travel Award, and second, he has approved uh, uh, that I can increase department operating budgets at the rate of $200 per unit a faculty member to be used for travel according to that department's travel policy. Now since not all faculty will travel, uh, there'll be money available beyond the $200. So if you take the 575 in the Provost Award, the two to three hundred dollars in the department and the support from the colleges, I think we're getting up there close to a thousand dollars again to support faculty travel. As the president announced, purchase approvals will be raised from five hundred to a thousand dollars. I have asked the deans to do evaluations of high performing programs to see if additional investment will yield more students, but I've also asked them to evaluate poorly performing programs in each college to identify areas of needed support or elimination. There are likely to be additional budget reductions. The pay raise for next year, which you have all earned, will likely have to be covered by reallocation of funds. And there will be other challenges before us. We must be prepared in academic affairs for further reductions in our budget. the Student Persistence and Completion Academy. WIU is a part of this academy. It's tied in with the Higher Learning Commission. It involves a four-year sequence of activities designed to improve persistence and completion of students. Its emphasis is placed on gathering data, evaluating current strategies, and creating new initiatives based on what is learned. Vice President Reeves is putting together various groups to work on this initiative and he'll be asking faculty to provide their expertise to make this initiative a success. Now, let me just spend about two minutes talking about best practices. You often hear me speak about best practices. And I want to go through what I believe the best practices are that we employ in academic affairs. A commitment to faculty governance. I attend Senate meetings every week. I meet with numerous committees and groups throughout the year, as does the president and other members of the leadership team at the university. I am available at any time to meet with any group. This is part of our values. This is the, what we do at Western. The consolidated budget planning process is a unique planning process, and we pride ourselves on the inclusiveness that is included in this process. Under Vice President Reeves' leadership, this planning is ongoing with participation from all areas of the university. President Thomas spoke earlier, earlier of our commitment to transparency in all we do and our willingness to communicate with all our constituencies. We are unique in being evaluated each year. The president and I are probably the only president and provost in the country that are evaluated by the faculty every year. And our deans and other administrators are also evaluated by the faculty on a regular basis. As I pointed out in my speech last year, we are committed to offering our students the foundation of a liberal education. Few universities are as committed to serving their regent than Western Illinois University. We are committed to following our contract and to following the policies of the university in a fair and consistent manner. And I believe that we in academic affairs have demonstrated well our commitment to our employees and to our institution. Now all universities do some of these, but few universities do all of them. We are committed to providing competent and professional leadership to ensure our continued success. Finally, I again want to say how honored I am to be before you today. My way of thinking has always been that to be in a position of leadership of any organization is a gift. And so I continue to be very grateful for this gift and for this opportunity. 
to serve Western Illinois University as provost and academic vice president. I would have liked to have had the experience of being provost of a university in good economic times. <laughs> but for the time being, I will still have to make very difficult decisions, particularly with regard to our resources. As I have explained today, <clears throat> academic affairs has outstanding support services and personnel. Our goals are established so as to help us meet our challenges. We engage in many best practices and principles that guide us and me in making those tough decisions. I often interview candidates for leadership positions in departments or other units on campus. And I always share my perspective on how one should go about making difficult decisions. First, when contemplating a difficult decision, a leader should ask himself or herself, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? What would my decision be if I wasn't afraid of angering someone, of being criticized, of taking risk, of standing up to loud and powerful adversaries? And then, in making the decision, one should ask, what is best for the institution? Not what is best for an individual or a unit or other stakeholder, but what is best for the institution as a whole? And by institution, I don't only mean Western Illinois University in the present with its current faculty, staff, and students, but I must honor its 120-year history and all those who contributed to its success. I must consider all of its stakeholders, faculty, staff, students, alumni, parents, friends, and donors, community members, government leaders, and taxpayers. I must honor the cluster of values which over time have made us who we are. It is said that there are two times to plant a tree. The best time was 25 years ago. The second best time is now. So in making decisions, I must consider the future and how that decision will contribute to building a firm foundation for future stakeholders. And as I said last year, it is my hope that you will all feel as I do about this institution, that you will want to become a part of its history, share its values and its future, and through your association with Western, you will feel that you are a part of something bigger than yourself. If you all feel this way, then there is no challenge that we cannot overcome. We will come together without fear and serve Western Illinois University, its students, and each other with a selflessness that can only lead to positive and fulfilling outcomes. I wish you all well during this academic year, and this concludes the 2014 Faculty Assembly.